Uh, I just wanted to start yeah, by uh, telling everyone thank you so much for uh, coming this afternoon uh, to this event. We're very uh, glad to see you all. Uh, I'm going to give a quick disclaimer, which is that we were not able to get this set up, at least at the moment, such that we could show slides. So my apologies in advance. Hopefully that will change. Um, but for now, we're just going to <laughs> go without slides. Um, but my name is John McLaughlin. I'm a board member of CAPS, and I have the great pleasure of introducing our two speakers this afternoon. So I will introduce them, and then they will take it from there. Um, our first, we have two presenters today. Uh, one is Hope Young. Hope is a board-certified music therapist. She is the founder and owner of the Center for Music Therapy. Uh, she's also the CEO of Biomedical Music Solutions, Inc., located here in Austin. Hope is a leading innovator in the field of biomedical music. Her research focuses on music therapy and neurologic conditions. And as we just saw, she's also quite a good guitar player and singer. Um, our other presenter this afternoon is uh, Kristen Barda. Kristen has been a practicing physical therapist since 2002. She graduated from Texas Women's University with a master's in physical therapy. <clears throat> Excuse me. She completed her transitional doctor of physical therapy degree at Boston University and then earned her PhD in physical therapy from Texas Women's University. She is currently uh, an assistant professor at the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences here in Austin. She is board certified in neurology and her research has focused on the treatment of patients with neurological disorders and vestibular dysfunction. And so the thing we're gonna focus on today that Hope and Kristen will be focusing on is uh, a new study that they are conducting in Austin, uh, which has received funding from the National Science Foundation that addresses freezing of the gate or fog for persons with Parkinson's disease, uh, as well as the effectiveness of externally cued therapy such as music in addressing this issue. So with that, Hope and Kristen, please take it away. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. John, thank you. Chris and I are really thrilled you guys to be here. Like I said, I've been involved in CAP since the mid 1990s and uh, it's always exciting to come back and uh, get to, to say, you guys are some of my main influencers. Uh, so everything you're about to hear and see from me, I know because of the community of CAPS, real people motivating me and a lot of the incentive behind the work we do, and Kristen and I, you know, are both clinical therapists, physical therapists and music therapists, and we have, you know, decades worth of work with real people that really are driving everything you're about um, here in our community. So what I'd like to go into is the introduction. How many of you are thinking about the fact that you are a fighter and that you're fighting Parkinson's disease in the middle of a pandemic. But how many of you think about you've actually are fighting two pandemics, right? I've been saying this to the community for quite a while during this whole pandemic. The WHO, a few years before COVID hit, designated Parkinson's disease at escalating globally at rates at a pandemic rate and being driven by our aging populations all across the world. So the people who have Parkinson's now, within nine years from now is going to double, even possibly get towards tripling. It's, it's people are, are getting diagnosed and dealing with Parkinson's in every country uh, across the globe at that kind of rate. So if you're feeling a little exhausted, know that's because you're fighting two pandemics at the same time. So you should give yourselves a lot of kudos. And what we're gonna be primarily talking about today, Kristen and I are gonna talk about just one of the areas that you know that in Parkinson's disease uh, needs to be progressively fought. We know that Parkinson's is a bouquet of symptoms and affects everybody individually. And when we talk about music therapy and physical therapy, it's never just one thing, it's the whole person and how all of the symptom uh, remediation and management ties into each other, right? A little bit of what John was saying, a little bit of the design in, in uh, 
taking on that challenge to effectively address that you've got to think of things as a whole. But where we're going to start today is you've got to drill down into to how we can be more effective. And that's something that Chris and I have really been working hard together to really get effective at one of the things that we can address this one area of gate, making it better, that goes to reducing falls, which if we can reduce falls and actually prevent falls, then we have prevented a lot of you by keeping you walking well, we prevent a lot of you from going on a dramatic health decline. How many of you have ever experienced or know somebody in your community that has had a fall and they have a dramatic health decline afterwards? Yeah, just think about that. So we're gonna use the next kind of formal structure part of our presentation to talk about the latest interventions, the latest uh, research and addressing the problem of loss of mobility, which is as you have slow gait, as your gait gets impaired, you are, that's what your issue is. You are having a problem with mobility and that's impacting a lot of areas. At the end of our presentation, we'd like you all to, uh, we're gonna have a nice time for question and answer. And we'd like to talk about depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, digestion, you know, all these other cognition, memory, all of these other things that are tied into this where music and physical therapy and other things can address it. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna drive now to um, some of the work with uh, evidence. And I think, uh, Kristen, isn't this where you take over or do I sure go is. into RES first? Yes, yeah. yes, thank you, Hope. Thank you for that introduction. And um, I think Hope did just a, a very, um, had some powerful points about, um, really what's lacking in our healthcare and rehab at the moment. Um, you know, these things have always been around, but now we have more research and we have more knowledge to know what um, has been proven to be effective to help with mobility. And we talk a lot about gait and walking because that is incredibly important to a person's quality of life and ability to be independent um, in their home and immediate community environment. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's kind of heard the, the term. Um, there are some articles on this um, claiming that, that gait walking is starting to be considered one of the fifth vital signs. Our vital signs are our heart rate and our blood pressure and the things that that we have to have to stay alive. And gait is really becoming up there on that list as one of those fifth vital signs, because what we now know is that the longer a person stays mobile, the longer a person can stay ambulating, um, the longevity of their life increases and the um, rate of progression will decrease. And this is for all people, um, you know, it applies especially to individuals with a neurological diagnosis such as Parkinson's, um, but just really anyone um, that as, as we age and as walking becomes um, more challenging and more unsafe, people do it less. And when you do something less, you lose more skills at that thing that you're doing. So, um, so what we're starting to kind of show for decades now, and it's really been, I think, heightened in the past decade at least, um, is the need to provide a strategy for people to have access to in order to maintain their mobility um, for as long as they can and as safely as they can. Um, and part of that ties into some of the, the auditory information that a person receives. Um, my background is physical therapy. So I have a lot more training in the, the movement and the movement strategies that people use to walk, to stand, to, to move from um, one surface to another. Um, but one thing that, that Hope and I are trying to um, really combine is just the integration of what we already do in our everyday life 
and use that to help with mobility. One thing we already do in our everyday life is use auditory information. I mean, you use it before you cross the street. You use it to, to complete just everyday activities, to be aware of the surroundings. And we're already using that. So let's tie that into mobility and let's um, capitalize on something we're already doing, something that's already going to happen to us and see how we can um, incorporate that into a person's life to maintain their mobility. Um, the research is now starting to show, uh, not now, but has been, and I think is, has written the, the number of research studies that has really ramped up in recent years is the incorporation of these auditory cues into movement. Um, based on the diagnosis of Parkinson's, um, the main issue is within that structure of the brain called the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia is responsible for telling the other part of your brain that controls movement to go. It gives it that signal, hey, go. And so that part of your brain that's supposed to move the leg forward um, gets that stimulus from the basal ganglia. And as the, the neurotransmitters and the dopamine start to diminish, there isn't as quick and clear of a signal to that part of the brain to move whichever part of your body you're wanting to do. But with the auditory cues, it kind of bypasses that. It gives you another route. And there are a lot of functional MRIs, a lot of studies that are watching what is being activated in the brain while a person hears a certain cue. Some of those are tied into the person moving. The most typical one is like a person tapping their finger to the beat of a metronome and how that the, the motor part of the brain is activated. It's it has action, it is working. But other studies, which is, to me is even more impressive, is a person is 100% stationary, still listening to this cue of the metronome and that motor part of the brain is activated again. It's working because we've now taken another strategy and we've said, you know what, basal ganglia, you're having a rough day right now. Let me help you out. Let me give you this auditory cue that can activate the motor part of the brain that we need to take the step to stand up, to reach for an object, to do what it is that we need to do in our, our daily um, function. So we have these strategies. These strategies have been in use from the music therapy world um, for a long time. It's what the it's what our experts like Hope use um, during the music therapy sessions. And we have the metronome, and then we have um, more of what we would call like a harmony or a melody. Uh, you know, I I played clarinet for in sixth grade and my parents made me finish out seventh grade and that's all the musical background that I have. So to me, they sound like a song, but what those music therapists are doing that's just so impressive is taking the right cue at the right time and giving it to a person so they can use it in function. And, um, and that's impressive. And that's really remarkable and kind of how they go about and do this. Now, myself as a PT with minimal musical background, what I have to offer a client during our therapy sessions is the metronome. And I'm not sure um, how much therapy people in our group have had already and if they've been used the metronome, but um, it, it's effective. It gives a cue. It gives that response that says, go, take a step, left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg, or reaching for an object. Um, and, and it's very, Specific, it's very concrete. There's not a lot of creativity to it. There's not a lot more than just here is that auditory cue that's going to help. And that is beneficial. And I use it because it's what I have available. Um, it gets repetitive. It gets pretty repetitive to a person after a while. Um, it, it starts to become almost, you know, just emotionally a little obnoxious, but, but it still can work in that moment in time as we apply it to the person. Um, and then when I partner with my colleagues um, who are music therapists, they can take that a step farther. Now, every song has a beat. You can tap your toes to it. It goes at a certain speed. It's that underlining, basically, metronome um, with 
pleasant melodies and harmonies on top of that. Um, and these get very specific and they, you know, get, they, they, they help the body move in a way that's specific to that sound. And as I, you know, several years ago, as I was learning more about this from Hope, you know, she's like, think of a very high octave. Think of like a flute or a clarinet. That kind of makes you want to sit up taller. That sound pulls you up. Think about a really low note, like a trombone, and it kind of grounds you down um, to the ground and it settles you a little bit. So these octaves and these harmonies can start to have a different impact on a person based on what they need. Um, you know, if, if you need, if you are an individual that um, has some festination or some freezing, you may need something that pulls you back a little bit. If you are a person that um, is starting to have some postures more into a rounded shoulders, lower forward head, maybe you want something that pulls you up a little bit higher. And using these can really start to impact the quality of the movement. So it's great I took a step, but I want to take the best step that I can. I want to maximize every movement um, so that I can get from point A to point B in the most efficient and safest manner possible. And, um, and, and what we start to lack in the PT world, um, I mean, I'll say rehab just in general, because applies to occupational therapy as well, um, is the difficulty of those of us that don't have the background in this musical field to really effectively use some of those strategies. And that's where we start to partner with um, our music therapists, such as Hope. Here in Austin, I think we're incredibly fortunate. I have worked um, in Houston. I lived in New York for a little while. I moved back to Houston and I've been in Austin and I did a little bit of travel PT. And there is not another um, city that I've worked in so far that has such a strong community of music therapists. They are few and far between. Um, so there is a, a large commu rehab community out there that doesn't have access to these specialized musics. And then that's really where Hope and I are starting to um, work together through some of her developments and, and really her, her hopes and her dreams to try to move that in to more of a clinical practice. Um, I also think, I'm sure everybody here has experienced it, is... Therapy, you know, rehab will help work on those strategies and rehab can spend that time if you get an hour with the therapist and you work on it. And by the end of the hour, um, you've, you've got it down, but it's hard to keep it down. It, it's, it's hard to maintain those changes when you have therapy for one hour, two to three times a week. You need this daily and you need it for um, a, a, a multiple minutes, hours of the day to really make those new strategies and help those skills become automatic. At the beginning, it takes a lot of thought. And the more you have to think about something, the less energy you're going to have to complete it. So if I have to think about my, my walking every single step, I'm going to make it, you know, 15, 20 minutes. If it's automatic and I don't have to have that cognitive load associated with it, then I can usually go a little bit longer because you're not as fatigued with that. Anytime any of us try to learn something new, it's hard at the first, it's hard at the beginning. So, um, so not only having more access to these auditory cues to create a, a new strategy for movement, but also having access to them when you're not in therapy. Um, you spend the majority of your time outside of therapy. So if we can have more of these systems available for a person in their home, it's just even better for that person. And we are in a world now where technology can do so many things. So we need to use that technology to improve rehab, to improve the um, access that people have outside of their therapy sessions, because really that is that that that's your world. That's where you live, and you need those in that space to to ensure that you can maintain your function and safety and mobility um, for as long as as we can. So I'm going to let Hope kind of steer us into that um, of really what she's been working on and and 
and where we're going with some of these, these new developments. Go ahead, Hope. Thank you, Kristen. That was excellent. And um, again, collaboration here at home and internationally is what we've been doing because Kristen and I are part of a global effort to address and improve uh, outcomes for everybody on the planet that's living with Parkinson's disease. We uh, are not in this alone. And I think that's exciting because when um, if I had, a, if we had the deck, <laughs> you could see I have pictures of the covers of at least three of the medical journals that have been publishing research on your gate on people just like Bill and Vic and whoever else is on here with um, Parkinson's disease, studying the newest applications of this old knowledge, right? It's, it's gosh, rhythmic auditory stimulus with Parkinson's disease. The first research that I read was from the 1970s, right? When I was in the 1980s training music therapist, then the 80s hit, but man, it went everywhere in the 90s once we had all these cool tools called, you know, PET scans. Uh, the geeks were like using music like crazy to play with this new tool to make the brain light up like a Christmas tree. So, I mean, even people outside of the domain of music therapy in that decade of the brain, 1990 to 2000, just exploded studies that with all the new imaging, MRIs and PS, they were using music um, because it was really a cool human phenomena that lights up so many areas of the brain and, and got a lot of the, what I want to call the science geeks excited. So we have decades of this intervention with Parkinson's, but the same experience like Kristen that you kind of plateau, um, you get bored, it becomes just a, a background noise um, and it's limited. It's only going to activate the initiation of gait. It doesn't necessarily improve the quality of gait all around. And, and then it's not enough anymore. I got tired of it because why I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay, now that we're to this level, we've been going too long with just a metronome in physical therapist hands or in you know, some of my patients taking the metronome home, attaching it to the walker and using it to get around. It's not enough. There's more that what the brain responds to, to musical patterns, than, than this. And it's not enough. There's just not enough ever. It's never, never going to be enough for me when it comes to really challenging um, ourselves with how much you can live better with Parkinson's disease until we have a cure. We have got to do better, right? So that's driven me uh, to do uh, uh, product development take the research and I'm gonna go back a little bit. I'm gonna let you know, I started a second company. So the Center for Music Therapy was founded here in 1990 in Austin, Texas. I founded the very first for-profit music therapy facility in the world. Like I said, I don't settle very well with, we're doing enough, it's never enough. Every patient that has fallen on me, it's just made me grind more like I know this could be better because what I can do with this little guitar like Kristen was talking about, let me just show you what 1980 to 1990 was like for me. There's a beat, there's an upstrom. So I can do this. And I can get a person's heel to go down on the beat. And guess what with that upstrom? Oh, that's down. I'm sorry, with an upstrom. Upstrom, we go up with the knee. When we go down strum, the leg goes down. I can do that back and forth live, but as soon as you went home from the hospital that I was working with, it wasn't working anymore because back then it was cassette tapes or, you know, you couldn't do much, but people did so much better in their PT with me doing live that as soon as they're at the toilet and at home and then fall on their face trying to get up and go back to bed at night, it was making me angry when I knew if I could just take that stimulus and those kind of access to that and get it there in the middle of the night, get it there at their bedside, get it there anywhere, anytime. So Kristen has been doing research. We've been doing research together. And then from there, I developed a product. Uh, it's called Sound Steps and it's been used in research by over a half a million users now. 
and the International Journal of Neuroscience uh, in January 2020, uh, a team in Italy, a leading uh, neuro neurologic institute, has been using sound steps with the Bidex gate training system with patients with um, stage two, stage three Parkinson's. That means that you're using walkers, you're using canes, you're having problems with breathing of gait, definitely having impaired mobility. Um, in that study particularly, uh, well, actually it was another team. They, they showed improvements in gait really quicker and better than anything we've been able to do before. Most of the equipment that they've been using for PT has biofeedback that has visual and audio cues, but that's not necessarily music that has been designed to trigger the brain before the movement begins to reach a specific target. And that's what we do with sound steps. Instead of waiting till after you take the step to take your measurements and then you have to decide, oh, I'm gonna use that cue to take a bigger step. We literally know what to do with this science make the cue before you hit this, even put your foot down to drive you to take a bigger step and not even have to think about it. So that product sound steps um, was used with, with the International Journal of Neuroscience showing faster and better gains if you have Parkinson's disease using sound steps combined with a neuro rehab equipment like a treadmill that also is capturing all your data creating a good report for you to understand and see quick measurements and gains. In the Frontiers of Neurology uh, article published in August of 2020, that was the one I wanted really, I got really excited about because we've seen publications in all kinds of journals using sound steps integrated with um, biomedical devices that you guys would all use. They're used all over the world. Biodex Medical System has been around like 40 years. Um, and a lot of the machines that we integrated with have been in use for decades. Um, so when we updated this audio cue, they're seeing these faster and better games, how quickly versus just traditional PT and traditional biofeedback cues, even a metronome, that we're getting better and faster at improving your gait by your step velocity, your step and stride length. Um, balance, all these measures are improving. Well, these, this research team in Italy, Dr. Cabrero, they wanted to know why. They wanted to not only say what's happening, they wanted to look at cognitive changes and some other emotional changes in the patient when you do this, when you use this, the right music is what they call it, like that's specially designed for this. Um, with that study, what was exciting for me, because well, Kristen and I don't have to we don't have our hands on some of the, the high level of equipment. And it was shipped to me. I didn't go to the store. Pam, Pam, could you yeah. mute your mic, please? It still be I'm sorry. It should still be returned. Thank you. Um, what, uh, sorry, where was I say? What they wanted to know was, was why, right? What's happening in the brain? So they had patients walking on the Biodex treadmill. Uh, and they also had uh, patients who do really good PT and they've got a great PT team. Um, and what they found is those who use the Biodex great training system with the sound steps, with the music we produce, they made significantly faster and better gains. And they had them wearing what's called an EEG, walking EEG. So the patients, the doctors and researchers can look at what is happening in the brain while in real time while the patient are walking. So the ones that had PT, the ones who had the music condition with the treadmill training. And what they found is there were these cognitive efficiencies that the way we designed the music precisely to activate the motor cortex and the basal ganglia, very specifically without lyrics, very much, we only allowed five instruments. We were very precise that we only allowed the strum up or a sound going up, an auditory cue going up when the knee's supposed to be going up. And then it goes, boom makes this melodic down step to hit the heel strike again. We did what Kristen said, we added a higher, uh, a, an instrument that would go up like your spine going up and then float very high over your head to keep your posture upright. It was designed in there to keep the posture and the balance centered with some other things that we had studied to find where you could keep your trunk more centered, frequencies and sounds that matched your body. So um, with that, 
they found that there was so much more cognitive efficiency in your motor cortex with your cognitive areas that were helping explain why your walking and your balance is better when the music was used very precisely. It was designed precisely based on data that we took from studies here with a lot of you guys. Um, and that we got that data and we created these as uh, auditory information precisely to be applied to Parkinson's patients with mobility issues, with gait deviations and balance problems. So what's exciting about that is that we have, you know, 140 hospitals now all over the world using sound steps, more than a half a million patients all getting faster and better results. I want to say a little bit about Kristen's research. Kristen, can you come back on my So you guys kind of understand, um, John, you had made the comment about this wonderful thing about Austin. Realize CAPS and CAPS members and physicians and CAPS who've been referring and, and, and doing our studies, we are the ones who've been impacting those millions of people that are going to grow into millions more because we did the work here. And we did it on a dime uh, by using my center, collaborations with the universities, Texas Near Rehab, Dr. Morledge, uh, a lot of people coming in and putting in their time pretty much for free. Um, and all of you guys volunteering um, through years, step by step to get to a more precise application of auditory structuring and cues that were musical to really precisely only activate the areas of the brain that we wanted to activate and not to involve other areas of the brain that we didn't want to activate, which is what I used to do in the 90s. It was sloppy, a sloppy application of music. So Kristen, when we first did the first study, we had the metronome, the basically a beat, right? Yep. And we had those conditions. And then we added things that were, since, John, have we got video yet? Because the video does a better job of this. So sorry, we don't, I apologize. All right, so um, you might do a, Boom, can you hear that? Boom. And that's the new, the up and down motion of the leg, right? That's the kind of sounds that we would test out. And Kristen, we started with uh, first a metronome and a group doing RAS, and then we compared it to a group with music. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the first study I think you and I did together. And then we took it into the lab where I created a technology, I patented it, and the patent's been issued this year, July 19th. I actually own an issued patent by the U.S. Postal, Postal mm -hmm. Patent Office. And the EU is about to issue ours in Europe, and uh, Japan is soon to follow behind in Canada. And even in China, we didn't file for a patent, but we've got a lot of use. So. Kristen, after we did that study, we, we took sound steps into a lab and we did a blinded study with patients and a lot of them were CAPS members. Do you wanna describe that study a little bit where we had PTs using it independently, music therapists, and a little bit about the research that got us to these kind of results. So you guys understand how your brain's working and how old music where you're just dancing and it's just a bunch of music coming out is great, but there's a whole new era and a whole new level. And Kristen did one of the studies that really broke it down. Yeah, th sure, I'd love to. Um, yes, as Hope mentioned, like we kind of started really like mirroring things in the past that have already been shown effective. And one of those is the metronome. So that steady beat, that steady sound, and there's a lot of research. That, it, that shows that it does improve step length, it improves velocity, um, it makes changes in cadence. Cadence is how many steps you take in a period of time. Usually we measure it with a minute. Um, I say change because for some people, having fewer steps in a time frame is better um, because that means you're actually taking longer steps and, and taking a, a better stride. Um, so, so really in the world of a PT gate standpoint, we would consider the metronome uh, kind of the gold standard. It is what has been shown to be effective. It makes these changes consistently um, throughout the population. And so we took that metronome and then we, we um, 
compared it to the software system that contained the musical component that Hope is talking about. Giving something rather than just having like the upbeat and the downbeat, having more quality to the movement over um, simply did I take a, an improved step? And did I walk faster? And so we compared those and um, they were significantly correlated, which means that the software program that has the auditory musical component to it works just as well um, as what we've always known to work, which is the metronome. So we took both of those first, and within that study, what we're looking at is the validity of it. Is it valid? Is this new tool valid and going to work like what we've already had? Um, and then the second part of that was, you know, I told you about my great musical career that my parents um, forced me to continue for an extra year because they'd already bought that clarinet. So they said, you're going to do at least two years of band in junior high. Um, can I use this system as well as hope, whose life has been devoted to this training? Um, because if I can't use it as well, and I don't use it appropriately or correctly, it doesn't benefit the person I'm working with. Um, so we did that, and that's what we kind of call our reliability. Am, am I as reliable as hope? Am I going to choose the correct sounds for a person to improve their gait. Um, and all we did, myself and the music therapist, um, we had one other PT who's here in Austin and works, um, she's worked at Hope's Center for Music Therapy and a lot with individuals with Parkinson's, is um, we just did what we call an observational gait analysis. Really fancy term that they put in our textbooks that just means I watched how the person looked when they walked and I made changes. And when I felt like the person had the best um, overall biomechanics to their gait, then I measured them across my computerized mat that picked up on their velocity and their step length. And the music therapist did the exact same thing. So I didn't know what they chose. They didn't know what I chose. And those were also um, statistically significant. So the PT and the music therapist were able to use this software. So again, I did not play any instrument. I took the sounds that Hope had created and played those in a combination um, to impact the person's walking that I was with. And so that's that's huge. And then the next step of this um, that we kind of want to stumble into, and, and I want Hope to elaborate on this as well, is now this is a software system. This is a, a this is a, a basically a song, and we download songs on our phone all the time. So guess where this auditory cue gets to go? Home with the person who needs to use it. Um, it is great if you can take five minutes, but I need you to have it at home. Um, because really what we're, I think one thing that is, um, we're struggling with healthcare is access. Um, we need things to be more accessible. I think COVID has forced a lot of that. We've all now realized that we can have a pretty effective telehealth conference with our physicians and, and people in healthcare. And that's, there are a whole lot of things I'm not liking about COVID, but I am liking the push to make healthcare more accessible and, and convenient and um, quicker. Quicker. Kristen, we've lost you. It, I, I need people to get this as soon. Oh, let me see. Hold on. Can you hear me now? Back. Yeah, we can hear you. Am I lost? Yeah, right, okay, now, I'm back. Okay, good. We got good. You. Someone yeah. said they couldn't hear. I was about to type a chat. Okay, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Um, so one thing I always push and one thing I, I kind of when I talk to, to groups, especially um, individuals with Parkinson's is the sooner you can get into therapy, the better. PT, OT, music, um, the people 
typically, you know, and everyone has their own story that's unique to them, but you have things that you've been noticing for a while and that diagnosis takes a bit of time. And once you have the diagnosis, you probably can think back to some pretty clear moments where you're like, yeah, that, that's what that was. But I, I didn't have the diagnosis that takes a period of time and you have a diagnosis, but you know, any, anybody in, in PT, what, what I, what I want is I want to see you before you fall. You know, I, I know I'm going to get a referral after a person has fallen, but I want to see you before that fall because maybe we can, maybe we can prevent it from happening. You know, um, maybe we can have the appropriate strategies in place. So when you do lose your balance, cause we all lose our balance. I don't know if anyone's seen this. I just broke a hand cause I fell last Thursday. So we all have things that happen to us. Um, but if we have the strategies to help when we lose our balance, to help when we're in unfamiliar environments, um, that can really take a person a long way. And so I always, anytime I meet someone and they're like, oh, I was just diagnosed like last year, I'm like, have you seen PT yet? And they're like, I'm still walking pretty good and I'm doing okay. And my doctor said, I don't need it right now. And I say, just, just go see them once or twice a week for a month. And this doesn't have to be a lot, but you learn those and you get connected and you meet people like Hope who can maybe provide you with something that is, is usable in the house. And we can, we can prolong decline if we start early and, and, and start to use some of these different ideas that we have. So that's a little touch on the research um, that we've started and kind of that plug for finding those services. You know, we, we are very fortunate here in the Austin, Central Texas area to have things such as like the Power for Parkinson's to have this resource group. Um, there are two universe, two PT schools, rehab uh, PTOT schools here in Central Texas. One, I'm at the University of St. Augustine, which is um, down in Circle C. We have labs where we have people come in and um, we'll see what gets to happen in the fall um, with COVID, um, but we've been doing telehealth sessions with the students and the students will take a person through like a month of rehab, um, you know, kind of just having that check in and having someone who puts you through some balance tests so you can kind of see where you are and um, have a checkup. You know, we have annual checkups with our physicians. I feel that we need to have annual checkups with our rehab team as well um, to, to see if there's been a change in our balance scale. Maybe again, you haven't fallen yet, but now this outcome measure isn't, a person may not be scoring as high this year as they were last year. And can we do something now to, to prevent something more serious? Um, there's also Texas State. They have now moved from San Marcos their um, healthcare program is now in Round Rock. So people who are more up north, they have always had a pro bono clinic um, for people to come in and, and use. And it's led by a faculty, but students also participate in that as well. So kind of having those resources and hope I'm gonna let you kind of really talk, kind of wrap up the, the what you're doing right now and, and kind of what you're hoping to get accomplished with your project. All right, so one of the themes, we don't have our PowerPoint, but it says now is better. So in the past, we had to wait, right? All of you guys had to wait uh, until your symptoms progressed before, like you said, you got diagnosed, you got treatment. And it used to be back in the day when I started, you have Parkinson's, there's not a lot you can do. 10 years is the average life expectancy. And there wasn't as much hope. We have shown we were wrong. I'm glad we were wrong. Doctors that have been in practice really started changing their strategies. We found out about exercise, forced exercise. Wow, the more we can get you actively moving, we can prevent you from going on medications sooner. For now, we've got people living with Parkinson's and living well 20, 30, you know, 40 years. I know some of the kids that I met in my practice that were 18, 19, 20. They're they're doing well, but they're all living better and longer and they're getting ahead of it. And now the thing is, now is better. So you, everybody needs to be fit, but you need to start getting on your strategies and getting your plan laid out. Your doctors, all your therapists, where you're exercising. Now you can get data from your cell phone. 
your Apple phone, your Androids, they have health measurements. You have wearables that can be tracking your walking, how much you're walking. You can do these reports and take them into your doctor or share them with your doctor. You can do things now and you have access to healthcare measurements, to healthcare data, to your own personalized data anywhere, anytime that you're connected. So what's next for us? So we went to market with therapy teams all over the world that were already using Biodex medical system, landscape training systems that had EMRs and data and reports and data. Scientists are using that. Well, it's not enough ever. So I wanted to get here. So Kristen and I, with the next steps with our research teams, have been um, partnering with uh, University of Cal Poly, Cal State, uh, uh, where's Dr. Wade? I forget where he's at, Cal Poly, eh, Biomedical Poly. Engineering up north, yeah, uh, San Luis Obispo, is that right? Yeah, Cal Poly. I think, anyway, he started with the NASA folks down in Tennessee, but he's moved up there, and Nader is another engineer at Biomedical Engineering Team with a, uh, another company called Sensoplex that has a wearable that you wear on your right and your left, and it's specifically designed for Parkinson's disease with really highly clinical grade accuracy for your walking. So with this system, um, the NSF grant, and John, I just wanted to correct you, we are finalists and we're in the middle of due diligence, and it is just days away from them announcing if we win. And if we win, the money will be in all our bank accounts in 30 days and the study will proceed. If not, we have other foundations that are seriously looking at making sure this study gets done and funded. But we're right at the tail end of uh, being awarded this grant. So with this grant, the whole idea is taking these clinical interventions, a PT, good analysis, right, to, to address gait and especially freezing of gait, what happens when you're experiencing off episodes, when your medication, your dopamine is low. That's when gait deviations tend to occur. So we study that, we know that you're wearing the wearable, you have it attached to your phone, we can see that. There's another um, technology that comes in that's an algorithm that's added on top that now can know your normal gait. Let's say it's you, Bill, and you're walking around the house. It knows your normal gait. It also can analyze before it occurs when your gait starts to deviate, especially for freezing of gait. When that freezing of gait is detected, taking what we know about how we can use the auditory information for music so effectively, especially with more precise music that's only meant to activate the motor system, and with that higher cognitive efficiency, cue that before, before you start to deviate. And we cue that because we have an algorithm that is meant to predict before you deviate. So we intervene here instead of waiting for your gait to deviate before we intervene. So we're moving into the new world. What's coming next for Parkinson's is we've been working with Parkinson's since what's called a downstream solution. Like you're in this river, you're flowing in the stream of Parkinson's. And it used to be at the beginning when I started that we had to wait till you fell. The doctors had to wait till the disease progressed. Everybody was waiting till you got worse before you ever got really treatment access. Now we're moving it upstream and we're pulling you out of that stream before you get to that waterfall and fall off that, down that waterfall and crash. So this study is to look at putting together these technologies that have all been, you know, are in use, putting them together to give all of our Parkinson's patients across the world the chance to walk and keep walking better. So when you're using your Apple Watch, when you're using whatever wearable device, the idea is that it knows your normal walking, it knows when you start to deviate, it knows your deviated walking, and it's triggering instead an auditory cue that is meant to activate the part of your brain for Parkinson's and it needs to activate and only that before your gait deviates to keep you walking well. So that's what we're gonna be asking the question, is that better? Does it work? Is it better? Is it better than what we've been previously doing, which is traditional, PT, uh, other things. So we're on that curve now of studies and working then this grant, the NSF grant is, we're also in the grant that 
what the studies, if we show that that hypothesis, that question is supported, all our team has to get it then to market and get it to all of you faster and better. That's a new demand that certain funding that comes through the NSF is demanding of research teams. So that's why you see a quicker drive from just seven years of study to only a year and a half, two years of study, and there's a requirement to get it in, in users' hands, and then it has to be safe and effective. So that's kind of what's next and what we're doing and what, as we will let you guys know, the results of the NSF committee. Um, and if that comes back and we didn't actually uh, get funded in the next 90 days or so, we have other foundations. And if anybody has any support to help us get um, that funding. We really believe this is important work. And I just want to say, I want to give credit to Earl Dimitru, uh, my dear friend, Fran, uh, Fran Gerling, Kitty Hoskins, Don Hoskins, all of the people, Lydia Blanchard, there are just so many patients that have been involved in the studies, been behind my work, just buggered me senseless, never to give up when I'd get frustrated um, and just pushed me and challenged me to do better. And their lives has impacted this research as will yours, because we wouldn't be in Europe and in China and in Japan and in Canada and all across the EU, uh, sorry, uh, all across all those countries in the United States now, reaching millions of people now through the devices they're using and their PTs without everybody's support here and all the, the doubts and the questions and the hopes and the hard work that have gotten us to this point. So. Without further ado, I think we're going to let you guys ask questions because um, I know there's more to it. There's, I didn't talk about in the study, uh, the Frontiers of Neurology Journal, uh, they were looking at depression scales and anxiety scales, and there were dramatic improvements is that when you improve the gait, the cognitive load, we also saw the measures they took on depression and anxiety, uh, the, all, everything improved all across the board. So there's a lot we can do here together. So who wants to open up? Who's got a question or anything? Well, we have some time. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask a question of, of our speakers. And John, if, if there's any way to share our deck, which we were stumbling a bit without our deck because I have gotten reliant on, I had tried to stumble around with words, but instead, if I could have just clicked a video to show you what it looked like and let you hear it, it would have made sense. And they're all in our PowerPoint. Um, we worked to the pandemic where you can see somebody just using music who had freezing of gait and festination, and he quickly, bam, improved and you could hear and see the work, but we're just, we we're missing our deck, you guys. So we stumbled with words where the videos um, and the graphs could have just shown it very quickly and you could have heard it too and seen what it sounded like. So if we could share that eventually with the group or that would be great, John. So they could Absolutely. actually- Absolutely, I will, I will work with Mary to say that, that I'm sure we can make that available to folks if they're interested in seeing that, yes. So any questions or comments? Is there anything, um, I just want to ask, how many of you use music? If you're going to power for Parkinson's, you should be in Nancy's dance classes. You should be in all the exercise classes using music. Are you doing that? Even rock steady boxing and, and uses music. Are you guys turning on your brain and activating it? How many of you, hands up. Let me see you guys on video. How many people use music already? All right. All right. What about speech and singing. Good. Thank you, Bill. How many of you speech and singing? Do you know that when you have to take a breath and sing, that's why if you heard all the studies with COVID where mask and choirs had a higher susceptibility to spreading it, you take deeper breaths and use a whole lot more volume and you activate these muscles and mechanisms in a different way. You access other parts of your brain. So guess what? Your speech improves when you sing. The more you sing, your speech and swallowing improve. And that's another thing. Even if you can't carry a tune in a bucket, sing in the shower, sing in the car, sing out loud. If you're in many of my groups, I want the loudest, most off-tone person to belt out there and show the wave with Parkinson's. You're only going to get better with your speech and swallow if you use it. And speech isn't enough. Singing, 
singing, shouting. Um, that's why you do your big and loud. Um, and the more you do it, the more you improve. How many of you use music to go to bed? Hands up. Anybody use music to induce sleep? Nobody? Well, here's one of the things I want to say about that. Remember how I said in the 1990s, the geeks got their MRI machines and started, you know, having people play music, sing music, and they could get the whole brain to activate at once, which is still neurologic phenomena. That's really cool, right? But that's not cool when you're trying to go to sleep. That's also not cool when you are advanced Parkinson's and you're on a treadmill trying to do gait. We do not allow that kind of activation. <laughs> it's too much. And it's too much when you're going to sleep. So classical music that's got tons of instruments, volumes going up and down is not what you want to go to sleep. Even though it might help you with anxiety, it might help you with imagination and visualization. You really need music that doesn't have any starts or stops. You want music that does not make sudden volume changes. You want music that doesn't have a strong beat because you heard what Dr. Barta just said, that even when you weren't tapping your finger, the, th uh, the, the, uh, the brain, the part of the brain that initiates movement was still activating and if you weren't moving, that happens if you have a heavy rhythm and you're trying to go to sleep, your brain activation there is going off and we don't want that, right? We want you to get to REM sleep as fast as you can. So we want sustained tones, that don't start stop, that's calm, uh, very little rhythm, and we want it to go off in 20, 30 minutes. So um, that after you go to sleep, your body is not still listening to music, even though you sleep, it's preventing you from getting into REM. So these are some things to know. The other thing I just wanna say, I know that we're about to wrap, is use the music like we did. We have inherited this phenomena of music over 40, thousand years as humanity. Your parents' parents and all before that were making music, right? They were making music, there was music on. We did not have electricity until the turn of the century. So all these phenomena, all these things that I'm talking about to activate your brain is great and it is your inheritance to use it and activate it, but you need to make the music to keep that strong. We came together as families and communities by people singing songs in church. Many churches didn't even have an organ or a piano. They sang just their voices. Again, you had to have those clarinet lessons, those piano lessons, whatever you had, because nobody else could make the music. Now it's a commodity with electricity, everybody carries it around, but that's preventing people from doing music together. And when you do music together live, there is a strong emotional bond. And even on Zoom, Bill, I know you're in our exercise classes. How many of you are doing choirs? You, even in this virtual pandemic, when you make music together, you emotionally connect and it really melts away the isolation with your partners, with your loved ones. There are memories you can share by sharing songs and the stories around those songs and the memories, what they mean to you. When you sing, roll out the barrel, we'll have a barrel of fun. That was Earl Dimitris, one of his favorite, man. Did the whole room liven up and we'd go for drinks. And you didn't have to have a beer to have a great time and forget how good it feels to be together. And when you have music on, the room is chatty and everybody's talking, the music stops, everybody gets silent, right? That shows the power of music, connects you, makes you comfortable, builds bonds. And I just want you to remember to use the power of music in your life. My job is to bring all of us from here to the world into a new era of music's applications in medicine. That's my job on the planet. For the rest of us, it's to be the best humans and to drink, have fun, celebrate, grieve, uh, woo women or men, whatever you want, the way our ancestors have always used music to live a really rich and wonderful life. So any further questions or comments? All right, Kristen. It's good to end on a better note than that. So Hope and <laughs> Kristen, thank you all very, very much uh, for being here. And yes, uh, if you would like the slides that we unfortunately were not able to share, um, you can email Mary or just info at, well, let me give you her email address so that I don't goof it up. Um, let's see. And it has our contacts on the last slide and, and we will, 
uh, GAPS wrote a letter of support to the NSF. Um, they're behind uh, this research, taking it to the next level. Um, we will inform CAPS and we will reach out to you. Okay. Uh, all right. Bye. And in the meantime, those of you who are involved with us, thank you. You're being great guinea pigs for us. Those of you who are volunteering and messing with all the tech support and the virtual world, we really appreciate you guys to keep uh, working with us to just work out all the technical issues of virtual. This study, nobody is going to be in your home. It's just going to be you alone. So we're working on those elements. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So I've put Mary's email in the uh, chat and feel free to email Mary, who's our, the one that keeps the uh, wheels on the bus spinning. And we will be sure to get those slides to you on, which yes, include your contact information. Thanks everybody. Thank you very Stay much. well. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.